Hello and welcome to this video on how to run a Monte Carlo simulation study in M+. In this video, I want to discuss the M+, output for a simple simulation. In case you're new to this channel, on this channel I present weekly stats tutorials often related to structural equation modeling and M+, as well as other topics. So if this is something that you enjoy, then please subscribe to this channel and also don't forget to hit the like button in case um, you like this video. So in part one of this video, I showed you the M plus input file for a Monte Carlo simulation of a simple regression model with two independent variables and one dependent variable. And in this video here, I want to follow up and I want to show you the output so that you can see what you get in M plus when you run a Monte Carlo simulation study. In general, this is a very simple example and you can also do this for much more complicated models and so in this presentation I just want to give you a sense for what it looks like to run a simulation in M+. So if you haven't seen that first video on Monte Carlo simulations where I discuss these, the syntax and the input file then um, please check out the link in the description that where you can watch this video first maybe if you haven't seen it yet and so here just as a brief recap the population model here in the syntax is specified in terms of a simple regression model with a dependent variable y and two predictor variables x1 and x2. It's a um, simple or um, a multiple regression model with two predictor variables in the input file. As I showed in that previous videos, we assign the population parameters um, for all the parameters of this model. That includes here the regression coefficients, the variances of the exogenous variables, the residual variance of the dependent variable, um, intercepts and means, as well as the correlation between the exogenous variables. And in this example, I am simulating a correctly specified model, meaning I'm fitting the same regression model to each sample that um, generated these data. You can also simulate models that are not correctly specified in M+, but in this case, we're just using the simpler case where the model is correctly specified and we can check out um, parameter bias, standard error bias, for example, and also statistical power as well as type 1 error rates for parameters that are zero in the population. You can see that in this example here, I'm using a sample size of 30 in each replication to see if this regression model works well with a sample of size 30 cases. That's a question that we often have questions that people very often have is, oh, how do I, do I determine the sample size for a mediation model or for a structural equation model or for a confirmatory factor analysis model? And so by means of a simulation, you can check whether, for example, a sample size of 30 is sufficient for this regression model or whether you get bias, whether you get um, insufficient power and so on. I'm running the simulation with 1,000 replications here. Now let's take a look at the output file. And the first thing that we should always check when we run a simulation in M plus or in another program is whether um, we get any error messages. So here it looks good in terms of the input reading terminated normally, so that looks good. And then what is also a good sign here is that the number of replications that were completed is the same number as the requested replications. You can see this here. So we requested 1,000 replications and all 1,000 were completed. Sometimes it happens that not all replications are completed and that could be the case, for example, if you have non-convergence in some replications. So for example, if you're simulating a confirmatory factor analysis model of um, a more complex nature or a model that is um, too complex, at least for the sample size, then it could happen that some of those replications do not converge. And then you would get a, a lesser number of completed replications than requested. Now, if that's the case, then you can check out error messages in the tech 9 output in M plus at the very bottom of this output file where you could see why uh, or you could get, get at least a sense for what happened to these, that there was an issue of convergence, for example, or also, there could be error messages associated with completed replication. So it's always good to also um, request and inspect the Tech 9 output when you run a simulation. Now here, this is a 
very standard, saturated, linear regression model. So nothing should go wrong and nothing, nothing has gone wrong. There are no error messages whatsoever, no convergence problems. And so in this case, we can proceed. And then I'm skipping over part of the output that isn't relevant um, for us, and that is the fit statistics. One thing that I do want to point out, though, is that you always get the sample statistics for the first replication out of the 1,000 replications, in this case, in M+. And that's um, so that you can check that everything looks reasonable. So if you got sample statistics, let's say means, or you got correlations for the first replication that look completely weird or that are unexpected, then, um, then that can show you that something maybe also went wrong with your parameter specification in the population model or something like that. So it's always good to keep an eye on that. So for example, here we would expect those means to be pretty close to zero because they were simulated like that as population means of zero. Now, they don't have to be exactly zero, of course, in that replication because the replication is a sample of size 30 drawn from that population and we have sampling error. And so you can see here that those means are not exactly zero and the last one actually deviates quite a bit from zero, but that's still within reasonable um, expectation f uh, with regard to sampling error in this case. Also, you can see that the variances here um, are close to one, which they should be, because in the population um, model, the variances were specified so that they are one. And so that's also here in the diagonal of the covariance matrix, you can see values that are pretty close to 1.0. So that's just a way um, that M plus allows you to check your results for plausibility um, given what you specified in the population model. So again, if you found descriptive statistics here that looked completely strange in terms of what you would expect, then you should go back and check your input specification one more time to make sure that all your population parameters were specified correctly. Now, what I'm skipping over now and what I actually cut out here is the section on model fit. You can see I put little dots here um, to indicate that there's normally more output here. I don't want to go into the details of the fit statistics because they are not relevant for a saturated regression model. If you want to learn more about the fit statistics output and what it means in a simulation in M+, then please check out the description to this video where I offer a free workshop that goes more into the details of sample size planning using Monte Carlo simulations in M+, and in that workshop I also talk about the FIT statistics in more detail. I, I, I simulate a more complicated model in that um, free workshop that, um, uh, for which the FIT statistics also make sense. Now here on, in this uh, brief presentation, I want to focus on the model results section, which is usually the key section that we care about when we run a simulation that's often the most important section because in this section we learn something about potential parameter bias, potential standard error bias, and or power. And so let me show you what you get here in the model results section. You can see that in this section y on x1, x2, you get first of all in the first column the population regression coefficients that we specify. And so in our population model, and then also for all other parameters, um, the population values are provided so that you can once again check that this is in line with what you intended. So you want to make sure that those population parameters are all correctly specified. And so then in the next column, you get the average estimates averaged across the 1,000 samples or replications that were drawn from this population model. And this allows us to compare what the average estimate is to the true population parameter. So for example, we can compare the 0.8 regression coefficient to the 0.8039 average estimated um, parameter across those 1,000 replications. And you can see they're very close, indicating that there's no or very, very negligible parameter bias. And so 
that's a good sign. It shows that even with a sample as small as 30 cases, we can um, estimate this uh, regression coefficient without any average bias. So on average, there's no bias in, um, in this sample for estimating this value. And when you go down a little bit and eyeball the other parameters, you can see that there's also no bias really with regard to the other ones. The correlation is also well reproduced between the predictors. 0.50 is the population value, 0.4847 is the average estimate. There's a slight underestimation of that correlation here, but it's not very, very serious bias. And then also the other um, values are close to their population parameter. So this is a good sign because it shows you that even with a a small sample. In this case, apparently we don't get very noticeable parameter bias. Now, um, with, a, with regard to the standard errors, we often see bigger discrepancies. So standard errors are more susceptible to a bias when something isn't quite right. And you can also check that standard error bias by comparing the standard deviation of the parameter estimates um, across the 1000 replications to the average standard error. So meaning by comparing column three and column four for a given parameter, you can make sure that there's no standard error bias. You can see here that the standard errors in the standard error averages tend to be a little bit lower for some parameters at least um, than the standard deviation of the estimates across the 1000 replications. So there's very slight standard error bias, but again, it doesn't look like it's very severe bias. That's also a good sign. And then furthermore, M plus gives you the so-called mean squared error or MSE. The mean squared error is also a measure of bias and it actually combines the information about parameter bias with, with the information about the variability of the parameter across replications. The mean squared error is given as the squared bias, so the difference between the first two columns squared plus the squared standard deviation, so this number squared, to take into account the variability of the parameter. Now, the mean squared error doesn't have a super intuitive interpretation or any kind of cutoff value to my knowledge that is critical here. Ideally, mean squared error would be zero to um, indicate no bias, but there, to my knowledge, there's not a cutoff value that is um, accepted. If you know more than I do, then please leave a comment in the comment section about that um, if you know more about this mean squared error on whether there's a specific critical value that people look at for simulations. To my knowledge, that's not the case. The next column gives the so-called coverage, specifically 95% coverage, and it tells us what proportion of the replications, for what um, proportion of the replications, the 95% confidence interval contained the true population value of, for example, 0.8. And so you can see for this 0.8 regression coefficient, 93% of the replications, so meaning 930 out of the 1,000 um, replications, produced confidence intervals where the parameter, the population value was included. And that's very close to the 95% that it should be. So that's the important um, aspect here is that this number, the 95% coverage, should be close to 95% so that you can, um, so indicating that there is no bias with regard to the um, estimation of the confidence intervals. And you can see that that is relatively good for the first two uh, parameters for the two regression coefficients. It's less good for the correlation here. It's also um, a little bit less good for the variances down here where the coverage is um, below 0.9 for uh, some of them. And then finally, in the last column, we can see the percentage or proportion uh, of 
uh, times that a coefficient was significant at the 0.05 level across those 1,000 replications. And you can see that the 0.8 regression coefficient, which is very strong in this case, um, was found to be significant at the 0.05 level in 100% of the replications. That's why you get the 1.0 here. So that's a proportion and indicates that 100% of the replications had a significant finding, so to say, or in 100% of the replications was this parameter significant at the 0.05 level. So that shows you there was a lot of power, 100% power, to detect the significance of this coefficient. Now, the second predictor has a population um, effect, so to say, or regression coefficient of zero, um, meaning it doesn't have an effect in this model. And so then the percent significant coefficient column at the end gives us the type 1 error rate, right? Because that parameter shouldn't be significant in any replications. However, it will be significant in some replications due to a type 1 error. And so you can see that that was the case here in 7.3% um, of replications, so in about 7% of the replications, did we incorrectly or would we incorrectly assume that this parameter was different from zero based on a test of significance? And so that shows you the type 1 error rate. Now the type 1 error rate should be 0.05, so this is slightly elevated, meaning you have a, a slight inflation here of the type 1 error rate. It is This parameter is more often seen as significant than should be the case. That's what that tells you for a parameter that is zero in the population. For all parameters that are non-zero in the population, the last column gives you an empirical estimate of power. And for parameters that are zero in the population, it gives you an estimate of the type 1 error rate. Now let's check power for um, the correlation real quick. You can see for the correlation between the predictors that was set to 0.5 here in the population model, the power wasn't so great, only 0.77. So only in 77% of replications did we find that that correlation was uh, different from zero um, at the 0.05 level. And that's maybe not enough. Maybe we want more. If we wanted more, then we would have to use a larger sample. So that would be the conclusion here. So in summary, a simulation allows you to um, um, plan your sample size to make sure your sample size is large enough so that you don't have parameter bias, you don't have standard error bias, you have sufficient power um, to reject the null hypothesis when it is false. And so all this can be checked for a complex model using a simulation, for example, in M+. I hope you liked this video. Again, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and the like button if you did, and I'll see you next time.